brothers and sisters, I have the honor to introduce the next speaker. He's a friend, a mentor, a teacher, and he has a lot of knowledge for the time he did and the things he done for the IWU. I want to take this moment to introduce our brother Carlos Carlos from Local 10, Francisco. Good evening, brothers and sisters, friends, comrades, for those of you who don't know me, I'm referred to as the real Clarence Thomas, my wife. <laughs> With that designation, because after uh, the other Clarence Thomas was sworn in as a judge, believe it or not, I got a lot of first-class tickets on airplanes <laughs> because they thought that I was the other Clarence Thomas. <laughs> but now they know who I am. <laughs> uh, let me first of all thank the uh, Seattle Solidarity Network and the Occupy Seattle for this historic gathering tonight. And I say that it is historic because let me remind everyone in this room of the reality of the state of the working class today, in particular the trade union movement. In the private sector, only 7.2% of the workers are unionized. This is the lowest since 1900. It is fitting that tonight we have ILWU members and other members of labor and the Occupy movement all in the same room in the House of Labor. That's what time it is. The working class is in a state of emergency. All this talk about adopting people's agenda for purposes has to be addressed. The working class is in trouble. Not just the ILWU. Labor is in trouble. And whether or not you like it or not, you have to be honest and say that the Occupy movement has reinvigorated the labor movement. That's the memory lane a little bit more. I am from Local 10. I am not speaking for Local 10, notwithstanding the fact that I am a member of the Executive Board, but I stand before you tonight speaking as a rank and file and the co-chair of the Million Worker March, and I'll say this, thank goodness for the IMWU, we have democracy and autonomy in our union. It's important for people in this room to understand that this great labor organization, the ILWU, has as one of its founding members a man by the name of Harry Bridges. Yeah. And this worker, not from the South, but from Australia. Bridges was a visionary, a Marxist, and not just a union official. He was a labor leader who understood the class struggle. Yeah. Yeah. And don't mistake about that. Me, everybody in this room is very well acquainted with some of the ongoing historical contradictions that are going on right now regarding the ILWU and EGT. Maybe some will get into more detail, but I'm just going to say this. 
What we face now with EGT and the threats of lawsuits and all that goes with it to try to intimidate the leadership and the rank and file, this is not the first time that this has happened. I'm going to share with you something that's very close to me and Gabriel and every person of color who is a member of the ILWU. Jack Mulcahy made reference to the fact that workers have been used to scare. Well, I can tell you something. In 1934, when that great historic struggle took place, Everybody in this room needs to understand that there was another major contradiction going on. It had to do with black people crossing the picket line because there were only 23 black people on the waterfront in 1923, 1934, and that was close by. We have to face our history and tell it like it is. Black people had a history of being employed on the waterfront on the West Coast as strike breakers, going back to 1901. We were not loved by the unions. And we were faced with the contradiction of either we crossed the picket line or our families went home. It took Harry Bridges and other members of that rank and file strike committee of Local 10, who were leftists, members of the Communist Party and radicals, who realized that they could not win that struggle without getting the support of the black community. Continue here in Local 10, which has been described 
has the 30s. We refused to, to handle scrap iron that was destined to fascist Japan during the 1930s. Whether or not it was Local 10's refusal to work cargo from South Africa on the Ned Lloyd Kimberley in 1984 for 11 days. Yeah. Defines half hardly. I'll say it again. Defines half on his world tour upon being released from prison. He acknowledged the ILWD for that. We're known all over the world for that. That's why many of you are in this room. But it doesn't stop there. 1967, six months before Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated, he spoke at ILWD Local 10. He was made an honorary member on that day. This is the local that initiated the port shutdown in defense of Mumia Abu Jamal. The 29 port shutdown on May Day, 2008. <laughs> war in Iraq and Afghanistan calling for bringing the troops home on International Workers Day, May 1st, during a contract negotiation. <laughs> Shutting down five Bay Area ports in solidarity with the call for justice for Oscar Grant. Yeah. <laughs> April 4, 2011, rank and fibers, independent of our union leadership, the rank and file refused to go to work for 24 hours in solidarity with the workers in Wisconsin.
to come to Longview in solidarity with the brothers and sisters there and for ourselves? Will our children be longshoremen in the future? Yeah. Will they be teachers? Yeah. Will they be able to go to college? Our young people are facing $1 trillion in debt today. Yeah. Yeah. That is why the Occupy movement has been ignited and it's up to the working class and particularly organized labor to take their rightful place alongside this great movement. Thank you very much. Yeah.